What is it you want, Barry? What do you want? You, you want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it and pull it down. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dying times here. Come with me if you want to live. That's it, man. Game over, man. Game over. The Force will be with you. Always. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to 20th Century Geek. Oh, your regular host, Scott Weatherly, and I am back to do some Beverly Hills tripping. Uh, and who could who better to do that with than Jack? Jack, how are you doing? You okay? I'm oh, wonderful, thank you. Yeah, it's hot today, isn't it? So it's it is. a perfect setting. We're imagining we're in California right now. But I might be in a different part of Beverly Hills than Wonderworld. I might be in Wonderworld, I think. Yes, we are going to be talking the much derided uh, <laughs> Beverly Hills Cop 3. Um, which I have to say, I've always know, I've always had it in my head as being like, oh, this is a piece of shit. Like, this film is awful. It's... Mm. You know, um, watching it this time, though, I have to say, um, because I think I came at two a little sharp as well, hmm. um, I wanted to balance it out. Now, it's not the, I'm not going to go five stars or anything like that. <laughs> but um, I didn't have a bad time with this. I didn't have a terrible time. So um, we shall I see. The first hour's yeah, the first hour's okay. And then... <laughs> and then... Yeah, I, I will have. I do have thoughts on the the end, like the, the third <laughs> act and the finale. Um, yeah, there are, but there are bits in that where I'm I'm still kind of confused with certain things. We just like, huh? Okay, well, that was a choice. That was <laughs> that, that was a way to go. Um, yes, we will we'll have a go at that. Okay, well, let's sort of start. Basically, um, quick plot summary: um, mm. We are returned to Detroit, and uh, Axel Foley's back on the streets. Um, conducting a, a raid on a chop shop um, to take down a sort of a car thief gang um, with a bunch of the people. Being supervised and monitored by Lieutenant Todd, um, this thing goes ahead. It starts off as you expect it. However, at the same time, um, as they're doing their raid, the boys in the chop shop are conducting a, an exchange for um, paper, we'll find out later, with... Um, certain represent sort of shady representatives, including one Ellis DeWalt. Um, as the raid goes goes off, it turns into a gunfight and uh, comedy sort of ensues in certain places. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the gunfire, Lieutenant Todd is shot um, and gives his final words to Axel: "Of uh, is this? Are you on a coffee break? Go get that son of a bitch." And Axel (laughs) takes this to heart and, of course, travels to Beverly Hills. Or in this case, they find out that they're from Wonderland, which is in San Diego or Santa Monica. Um, And so travels down, meets up with uh, Billy and new detective, because Detective Taggart has uh, retired. Um, Whose name I can't escape from at the moment. Um, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, damn, I wish I could remember as well. It's played by Hector Alonso. Il- Hector Alonso, yeah. I was just trying to find his name. Um, and then starts to investigate uh, Wonderworld, including the owner, um, the kindly uh, old gentleman, best known as um, I did, yeah, Flint, John Flint. There we go, I found him. Mm, mm. Um, yes, and in doing so, sort of finds out that what they're doing is they are printing counterfeit money using... Uh, Wonder World technology that's going to be sort of Wonder Books. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the some of the usual um, Beverly Hills Cop banter ensues. Billy is over the top, and um, the new Taggart, John Flint, is the Taggart replacement. Serge mm-hmm. returns. It's all very sort of by the book, um, but yeah, kind of homely. Um, Let's run through though. Let, what, let's start with the raid at the beginning. Mm. This this whole sort of section. What are your thoughts on it? Sort of starting this with the start and how it's sort of you're re-entering this world for the Beverly Hills Cop. I think it's set up to start well. Yeah. The, 
Matthew immediately feels like Axel again. He's on the outside. Oh, we don't need SWAT. He cancels the SWAT, doesn't he? The captain comes up and is like, what? What do you mean you cancel the SWAT? Yeah, we'll handle this. So you know it's about to go wrong. And I think all of that's handled really well. And I like the cutting into the, the chop shop to begin yeah. with. It it gives it a sense. And you get to see you know, the people that are there. You get a little cameo from Al Leong. You get another one from a guy who, look his name up. He's like, oh, another guy who's like a henchman and everything. <laughs> Thomas Rosales Jr., just, yes. he's like another Al Leong he's just in everything yeah. in the 80s and I love the, yeah Al Leong even by this point he's is he famous enough as a henchman that he doesn't actually even have to do anything he just pops out of a car gets shot and he's like henchman guild a certification saved for another year yeah I'm not sure I was going to say like I f- it feels like they're wasted unfortunately mm. but I, I, do, I do wonder if that is a, I wonder if there's like a meta purpose thing going on there but i guess we'll talk about that in a minute so yeah i like the interchange uh, and the juxtaposition to begin with and then we get a weird dance number and it <laughs> starts losing me but i'm like what and then we cut back to murphy outside and he does this something in this movie which i don't think it does in either of the other two i may crept into his, his performance style all around now we know he's about to go on and start starring lots of family stuff but everything he does Every like joke moment comes with like a really wide eyed look. Yeah. And it sort of fits that, that, that phrase fits, I think his performance in this whole movie, like weed in terms of like, Oh, like the kind of over the top, you mentioned like um, Rosewood, you mentioned like run hopping over the top, definitely. But like Murphy's kind of playing that as well, but also like that, you know, the other meanings of wide eyed in terms of the kind of, you know, being a little bit perhaps naive or a little bit, yeah, no, I know what you mean. Misjudged in in how he's approaching this movie and the role and the development of the franchise. I don't know, something's off. I think, I think the, what's interesting about this is well, this is only this is nineteen ninety four, so it's been mm. you know like seven years since the last one. Eighty six, the last one. Yeah, like eighty six, eighty seven. Yeah, so it's been, so yeah, so it's been sort of you know, so it's been seven or eight years. It feels like, and I know this is the fact, they say that this was rushed. You know, mm. Murphy was a little bit disappointed with where his career had gone. He expected to, to maintain that superstardom. Um, and I think he felt that the, the shine was going off him. And so he was sort of falling back into the character to, you know, gather some of that mm-hmm. shine to get him back on top. Um, but where sort of, and this is what we said this about two that two felt a little it was confident because you had like Tony Scott behind the camera and it was all flash mm. and it was all gloss but Murphy felt a little bit kind of angry in a weird That's kind true. of way yeah. but in this one you see the anger's gone mm-hmm. but it's tempered in a different way in that he's sort of yes I want to be Foley but I, I almost I want to almost trying to hit that four quadrant film. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, yeah, this, I is got, agree with that. this is going to be the family Foley where PG 13, maybe, you know, I can get away with some effing and Jeffing, but we want, you know, we want that sort of four quadrant kind of uh, audience to come and see this film. Um, yeah. And it's it, a bit winky. It's a little bit like, a note I made was like, I feel like in Beverly Hills Cop 1 and 2, you're laughing with Foley. Yes. Like you're together in this. Like you're you're being him. Like he's a character you want to follow. Whereas I feel like here, we're laughing at Foley. We're laughing at Eddie Murphy, trying to be like, hey, hey, aren't I? Fa- hey. Uh, and that's, I think that's a, a shift, a change for me. And it's not a comfortable one. Yeah, no, I, 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 I completely agree with what you're saying. Actually, I hear what you're saying, and I'm trying to think. There's, a, there's, there's several scenes that come later. Like I would say his interactions with people come with that wink and a nod. Um, mm-hmm. and I even say his sort of his introduction, um, or reintroduction to Billy, and then his introduction to mm-hmm. Flint, is really sort of watered down in this one. Um, because in the other ones, it's been him putting on characters, you know, I am Johnny Wishbone and doing all that and <laughs> going off on one, and it's sort of like you know, Virgin on offensive, and you're like, oh god. Mm. 
in this one, it's him smearing his face on a window, and you're like, okay, you're mm. sort of you're three degrees away from donkey at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind of it's airing on that charge. As you, I agree with you. Like it's that four quadrant, isn't it? Like yeah, the kids well, all laugh at this. The dazzle, man. Okay, oh, my son does that, and, and yeah, absolutely, yeah. But I was, and I, I, there were moments. I still think there are scenes when the old Axel, the old uh-huh. Eddie Murphy, comes through. Um, even it's like glimpses of it, and I really like it when he does. But also, I would also say that in this, Murphy is there's signs of Murphy being more comfortable uh, being directed and being on screen, and he hasn't, you know, he's not desperate to perform like he seems to have mm-hmm, in the mm-hmm. past. And I think in this, he feels like part. So this this raid at the beginning, this is the first time we've had one where it's not him going, "Hey man, hey man, you got fifty thousand mm-hmm. credit cards." It's not him shouting off and gobbing off. He's part of a team. And he's working with people, and it kind of feels I'm, I, I can feel that there's that he's trying to get across. I mean, he even asks mm, someone an opinion. He, he says he says to someone, he's sort of like, you know, I cancelled SWAT, and the, his partner sort of says, yeah, fuck SWAT. And he's like, yeah, that's what I thought, fuck SWAT. And they're sort of, <laughs> you know, um, so it is tempered, but it's kind of like almost held down, but it mm. keeps wanting to get out of it. Um. So yeah, so that that I oh, sorry I went off on one of that. Um, uh, I, don't I hadn't thought thoughts. about that. That's a really interesting point. I hadn't thought about the. You're right. He's a he's a single character. He's kind of the lone gunman. He's the he's off on the mission, sort of do his own thing. You're right in the first two movies. Whereas here, he is totally part of the team. In fact, he's leading the team, isn't he? Yeah. And they they have faith in him and trust in him. The captain is like, okay, it's your call, go. You know, and so he's not sh- he's not the shouty captain anymore. He's the supportive captain. So that's really interesting. And that yes, that falls in line with what Murphy was saying is what he wanted with Foley. He wanted Foley to be more mature, to be less angry, to to be part of a team and to be a man in his thirties now who is Well, it feels a bit like you can tell that as we sort of said with the last one, the, the experiences of the last two films have taken an effect. Like he you know, he has sort of um matured and, and mm. you know, takes it a bit more serious and all this other stuff. So this whole scene at the beginning, like you know, when when the when is the cops talking? And then you're right. The weirdest thing is the dance, mm. which when they're sort of doing a shuffle, I'm like, okay, this is a funny. Probably this might even be a little funny improv that they've done. And then he does a cartwheel. <laughs> yeah, like the first thirty seconds are okay. You're right, yeah. and then it goes on. And it goes on, and it goes on, and then it goes on, and you're like, "Oh yeah, it's a John Landis movie." Okay, that's this is this is his level of comedy. That's this this is what he's bringing to this movie, and that's another really good point about who is behind the screen. I mean, this is the third director, third film, third director, and you know, the first one was really sort of, it was basically seemed like it was corralling Murphy so he could do his thing within the plot. And, you know, the second was a Tony Scott film and it looks like a Tony mm-hmm. Scott film. You're right, this is a John Landis film. And John Landis does different kind of comedy. Mm. Which Murphy can't now, you know, you know retrospectively, as he, well, we've seen him talking in talk shows and stuff, you know, he's not particularly happy it appears with this movie. But he asked Landis to come Landis to come aboard, right? This needs yeah. to be saved. So he asked him to come on because they worked together on coming to America, hadn't they? So it, it, even though famously they fell out on that, didn't they? It was coming to America and they fell out and had the big row. Yeah. And yet Murphy, you know, wanted him to come in and step in and quote unquote kind of save this, didn't he? So yeah, I do think again there's a there's a battle of of wills going on behind the camera and I'm not and and I think that affects the tone of the movie unfortunately like Murphy wants this more mature but Landis wants to bring in this kind of lampoonish style comedy that's not quite the right phrase but it's one that's coming to mind no well I think you're right well and don't this forget this moment exemplifies it yeah well don't forget Landis has strong connections with Saturday Night Live mm-hmm. so 
you know, he's done, um, well, you know, he did the Blues Brothers, um, mm-hmm. you know, one and two, as well as working on it. But then he'd also done big films like The Twilight Zone. Of course, he was the one that, um, you know, big trouble there. But uh, yeah, famously sued, wasn't he? Hence all the director cameos and, and yeah. And, um, well, like behind, you know, creator cameos is probably the right word to put it. Yes, yeah. and lots of his movies, isn't it, around this time? So, yeah, and Trading Places was one he did. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so he's done, you know, he's an odd, it is an odd one because it's, you can tell that they've obviously worked together and they've obviously gelled and, and, and they've had some understanding. But it, it, Landis just feels a really odd fit for a, a, an Axel Foley film. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. No, this this it's a bit mixed in, in the beginning, but I enjoy mm. the raid and what's going on. Yeah, the setup's interesting for them to be doing the police raid, and then for the other group of criminals to come in. That's a that's a nice idea. I like all of that, yeah. and it worked. I mean, unfortunately, I don't think the second set of criminals are particularly threatening. Any of them, I think it'd been if they'd got scared, if they'd felt like a, a threat, it would have been much better. And that's where I wonder if, like, oh, get get out Leon, we'll kill him off quick. So, all oh, these guys must be badasses if we kill if we kill, kill him off quickly. Maybe that was the intention. It just doesn't quite work because I don't know who is it. It's like Michael Bowen. It's um, yeah. Who's the guy? Who, it's Timothy Carhart is playing the wall, isn't he? Yeah. It's a group a group of blokes who you will recognise. They've got faces you'll recognise as being goons and henchmen and bad guys and other things but none of them are up to the level of kind of you know like Burkhoff and um proc now and um bridget nielsen and all these people have presence even we spoke about in the first one you know we had like the kind of i can't remember the names but you know the, like the guy from total recall and these characters have like good faces and they and, and they're mike isn't it mike from like, all these people are yes. memorable None of these guys, they're just all a bit disposable, unfortunately. They're not memorable. Well, I do I do think that is a one of the biggest problems with this film is is the villain. Uh, mm. Ellis DeWalt kind of the, the fact that they bring in John Saxon at one point later later <laughs> in the film kind of makes you feel like they're gonna they've said like, oh, Ellis DeWalt isn't enough. <laughs> we yeah, kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. we kind of need to pair him with John Saxon to give him a little bit of like gravitas and mm. um and weight. And then they obviously, you know, then there's the final turn, which we'll talk about with the FBI agent. And I, I really like um the the act, which was it? Stephen um McCatty. Mah- 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 yeah. Mah- yeah. 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 Um he's another like, you know, he, he looks a little bit like um Hendrickson. Um oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. And a bit like the guy from Prison Break as well. Yeah, yeah, he does, yeah. So he's got he's got a good look. I like so, him as, in as well. Like, the yeah. So they, they sort of seem to surround him with <laughs> these people yeah. that you're like, oh, he looks too soft and yuppie-ish and everything. He, you know, he's not we need to bring in some people that have a little bit of gravitas to sort of um mm-hmm. make it feel like a threat. Because this guy, Axel, would go in and beat the crap out of this guy in five minutes. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I agree with that completely. So that that is an issue. Um, the, one of the things I do, I okay, this is the thing that's the, I said about the balance. Mm. The uh, Lieutenant Todd mm. goes in, you know, and again we said this about um, in the previous films, the uh, um, Ronnie Cox's character gaining sort of, you know. Uh, respect from Foley because he's shown he was like a proper street cop and he knew all these things. And sort of, we feel that sort of same thing with Todd, that although sort of Murphy has always pissed him off and lots of other things, he kind of always respects him and stuff. Um, mm. But they've amped up the relationship in this one. Um, it's clear they've known each other for, you know, for longer than 10 years, sort of, you know, talking 15 longer years. How do you feel about them, that the, it's Todd's death that sort of triggers the the events i think it works well on paper i think it's a good idea i think it's a a shame for the character yeah yeah. killed off but i think it makes sense we said didn't we about like that actually the catalyst for beverly hills cop 2 was was decent like oh how do you get him back to beverly hills there again actually that worked quite well yeah um so i guess they needed to up 
the stakes again, didn't they? Bergman was shot but didn't quite die. So now we have to have something that is meaningful to to Foley to actually die. So I guess I can see it working on paper. Don't think the execution is particularly great. It doesn't quite land. I do like that moment you referenced before between the two of them. That's a nice mm-hmm. moment when he's when he says, you know, are you on a coffee break? Um, I think that, that lands and it pays off a little bit later at the funeral. I think that works quite well. I think unfortunately again it's it's down to how that scene has been been directed as it doesn't doesn't carry the weight that I want it to for something which you're invested in. I'm invested in these two knowing each other for as long as you said, you know, like fifteen years. Yeah. It's interesting because um reason like it. No, I do. I, no, <laughs> no, I go the other way. I actually really like it. And the reason I really like mm. it, and it worked for me, I think Murphy gives um, a good performance. Mm-hmm. You know, like I think this is, I think um, Murphy gives a good, I think it's, it, it, although the film has its real issues, I think actually there are times when I can really see it, like Eddie Murphy really, you know, he's trying to act mm-hmm, and do mm-hmm. things. And I think this and the funeral where he talks with Todd's wife. Mm hmm. Are actually really good scenes, and they're, they're really touching. But uh, recently, I rewatched the Lethal Weapon films, mm. and they have obviously the reoccurring captain in that, who is um, one of uh, Dick Donner's friends. <laughs> so he's all, yeah. he, he's 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 a bit like the, he's like the um, um. Oh my god, my name's got it's my eyes got a moment. Uh, Ash from the Evil Dead. Um, Hi, oh, Bruce Campbell. Bruce yeah. Campbell. He's like Tom Raimi's sort of Bruce Campbell. Like, you know, they, like this mm-hmm. is Dick Donner's sort of Bruce Campbell. Like, he appears in like loads of as cameos in in Dick Donner films. Mm-hmm. But they've always had this that relationship with that captain. And I I was thinking then I was like you know they go through and he's in every film and they sort of you know they have that back and forth and stuff and it's sort of like you don't think about it because it's almost they're almost like a either an exposition character or you know they become a plot device or there's something like that. And so they, they become a bit of a, you know, a nothing, or they can they can be a nothing character. But but Todd is actually a like, you know, and firstly I do like the the captain from the Lethal Weapon films. <laughs> but Gilbert Hill, who plays uh, Lieutenant Todd, is so memorable, mm. and is so good, and actually has a, you know being shouty captain and stuff is is he he was so sort of key to those first two films despite not being in them much, that mm. I I like this relationship. So when he sort of gets shot and he's, you know, it does feel in character for him to say, basically get after that son of a bitch. Yeah. Um, that when he lies and says to his, to Todd's wife at the funeral, oh, he just said about how much he loves you and the kids. And she's like, bullshit. <laughs> that's not, <laughs> that's not my Douglas. You know, he actually tells him, tells her, and he, she says, she says, that's it. And I'm like, yeah, no, that's that felt like an honest, like, character moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, agreed. It's like that we see in lots of movies, don't you? Almost like the, the, the he's almost like a, not an adopted son, but, you know, he's like the chosen one from the squad who probably has got to know he's been around for dinner or they've yeah. got to know each other. And it, it's that developed relationship. She clearly knows Foley well as well. They've got their own relationship that's been happening between the movies too. So, yeah, I I agree. It's a really touching moment. It's the best actor moment. I agree with you in the whole movie. Yeah, <laughs> it's a shame it happens so Not early. Not that there's much competition. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, both those things. Yeah, yeah. Um, what the, the, this is the thing about this? There's all these films, right? That I and I, I thought about it is, and it made me think about the other ones as well because it is quite touching, right? So in the first one, he has his friend killed. Mm-hmm. And that it's enough to drive him off to go hunt down these people that killed his friend. And in the second one, Bogomil's shot, and then it's he's you know it drives, it drives him enough that he takes time off work. He lies to sort of go and investigate what he should be doing something else to go and investigate. Mm-hmm. And then in this one, it drives him down to to Wonder World. But the thing it sort of triggers him ahead is the moment that you have the, you know, here's the the instigating event the purpose for him to go down to California and you get the do, 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 do. Like all of a sudden the tone changes and it's almost like Axel completely forgets Mm. 
Like the mm-hmm. reason, the, this one has it more because there's a few times where he like he goes off on one at DeWalt, but they they really do sort of go like we killed a person to so he can go on a revenge mission, but we're barely going to mention mention <laughs> or have any sort of form of grief or remorse or anything for the rest of the film. Oh, agreed, and I think here it doubles down because the remastering i don't know what you want to call it master is not the right word the reworking <laughs> of the axel f theme becomes it's, it's aiming for even more jaunty than it was before yeah. it's, you know it's 90s jaunty electro and it, it doubles down on that because it's even further away from where we should be it's yeah it's a it's a problem yes yeah it, i mean yeah. we don't get the uncomfortable montage this time do we he just sort of drives up to the revamped station, doesn't he? Yeah. And we get the really bad interaction with the computerized like gate. But there's 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 not like the uncomfortable montage of like, wait, sexy lady, oh dog doing a poo-poo. Yeah. Yeah. Here's, Expense- the here's the Chanel shop. Here's yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's still a very hard cut though. It is, it's a very hard cut, but it's almost like they they acknowledge that we can with three films in we can no longer take the Mickey out of the people of Beverly Hills. Sure. Yeah. Because if the, we, you, it's sort of too much of a trope now, like, you know, yeah. Oh yeah. That's fair. Um, Cause it would feel, it would feel almost like trite at this point, wouldn't it? If it had the, they just rolled out a very similar montage. You'd be like, yeah, we know we, we get that, but he uh, still yeah. keeps, he's got friends here now. He's literally got like people he's willing to sort of die for. In California, in Beverly Hills, it feels a bit yeah, it feels a bit silly. Mm. Um, we now then re- reintroduce to um, Billy Rosewood, uh, Judge Reinhold. Um, what are your thoughts on on the Billy's development and progression? So, what is he? Is the head of DOC IDOJS or something like that? I it's bet, the DD. It I've got, I've got, it, I've got it in the picture. The DDOJSIOC. No, I'm not I gonna tell you what. Yeah, I'm not gonna tell what it is. But I'm not, I don't know what it is, but it's it's. The, yeah. That's a decent joke. I will give the movie yeah. that and the rise. That's a decent joke, and it works every time they do it. Every time it keeps coming back up, I like the joke. It's good, and I'm really happy to see Reinhold and Rose Rosewood back. Let's be honest. Development. I'm not sure I'd use. Yeah, that word. I think between one and two, definitely yeah. there was, and they thought about how they could do some some change to that character and show how his interactions with failure changed him. I think they were written into a bit of a corner here, weren't they, of the fact that um, John Ashton couldn't come back to play Tagger and the fact that um, Bogan Mill's not back as well. I can't think. Ronnie Cox Ronnie is not Cox. back. They were supposed to be, weren't they? But then because of the issues with getting the film going, they were committed to other projects that they yeah. left. Well, well, Ronnie Cox's statement is actually was, they made me a reasonable offer and then I read the script. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so he chose not to come back. Fair yeah. enough. Um, um, yeah, so, yeah, I don't know. I guess they were, they were left in a bit of a position where, like, Roger's going to have to do everything and yeah. we try and have this tag at facsimile. And he really is a tag at facsimile. And the fact that neither of us could recall his character's name, I think, speaks volumes. Yeah, well, it hits me at one point, And again, I've never thought about this. I've watched this several times, you know, in my lifetime. But I never clocked. The whole thing with Billy kind of makes sense like you know yeah. of course he would end up in this position where he's got like a really complicated title and it's sort of over the top and actually it's actually a really good joke about and it kind of makes sense with los angeles being this way mm. and they've got the map haven't they with all the border lines on the it, green so, yeah. lines whoever Pretty controls crisis. the green lines controls southern california <laughs> so yeah i think all that's good fun the problem with flint is there's a scene that comes later when Axel's gone to Wonderland and caused a bit of mayhem, mm-hmm. and they've had like a brief inter- they've had a brief introduction, and Flint sort of said, um, "Oh, Taggart's told me all about you," mm-hmm. and that's it. Like they have this very brief interaction, and then but then over the radio comes this thing about um, something that's it's happened. The, at, it's the Ferris wheel, isn't it? It's the Ferris, Ferris wheel bit. Yeah, I was yeah. gonna say yeah. But this events happened at Wonderland or Wonderworld, and um, you hear Billy go. Axel, mm-hmm. and that makes sense. Yeah, but then it goes to Flint sitting in a car, and he hears it, and he says Axel, and I'm like, how the frig do you know? Like, you met them this morning, and you clearly haven't followed up on the one thing you said you were going to do. 
Yeah, I wrote down exactly the same note. I was like, why is he reacting in the same way? It makes no sense at all. Just take that line out. We don't need it. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. It's funny we both picked up on that. Yeah. So, th- so th- you're right. This is, a, as you said, this is a this is a tag at facsimile, and it doesn't work at no. all throughout the film. He just sort of feels like a, a weird add-on. I think just uh, write, write that character out, right? We don't need yeah. him. He doesn't really add anything to the plot. And it's not Hector Alonso's fault. I mean, he's been great in other things. Mm-hmm. It's not his fault. It's just the character. Well, it is no character. It's just somebody yeah. else on the screen. It's the, it's, a, it's the fact that there's supposed to be a, th- a trinity. There's supposed to be three of them. Yeah. And that's it. That's the reason he's there. Yeah. That's it. So that, in fact, there's, there's the reason it's there is so they can have a shot where Axel sat in the back seat and you've got <laughs> Billy and, uh, and someone else sat in the front. That's it. Yeah, that's... you're right. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, but you have this whole... Let's get to Wonder World then, right? So we've had yeah. all these things. Wonder World. Is it Wonder World or Wonderland? It is Wonder World. Wonder World, yeah. Wonder World. Oh, Wonder please don't. World. Yeah. <laughs> so that plays a lot <laughs> oh in God. this. Um, but he does... It, it, Axel... Yeah, gets into. I th- th- this is the, the the other bit. I would say I kind of enjoy. I think there's a nice bit here where it feels like there's a, there's a sort of a glimmer of the old Axel mm-hmm. when he's sort of talking to the ticket woman and she's like, oh, "It's thirty five dollars." He's like, "Thirty five dollars," um, and the two guys approach him and there's there's a couple of like good jokes in a row where he's like, "Can you step out of line?" And he looks behind him. He's like, "What line?" Like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then he finally goes back. And sort of pays for the thirty-five dollars, and it's sort of the face, and he knows he's playing them, sort of thing. So all oh, that felt like I was like, oh, yeah, you know, it, oh, again, a watered-down version, though. I think you know, think yes. about some interactions he has in the first two, and I know they're aiming for a more family-friendly. I agree with you, actually. I think the, the ticket booth interactions, and I like him kind of walking between the two security guys to get back there, and all of that's quite nice. But it felt safe. I wanted it to be a bit more rude, a bit, a bit more caustic, a bit more Murphy, really. Yes, yes, it should be. And I feel like these, he doesn't want to go there, does he? Because, you know, um, like, you know, Haunted Mansion and Doctor Doolittle are on his horizon. So, mm-hmm. you know, he wants to stay on the, the good side, I think, of certain people. And there were lots of jokes to play to play here, right? I mean, I'm, my brain's racking as I'm talking. I think maybe a couple of characters, but, you know, Wonder World is mostly a white world as well. Yeah. Now, that was something they really could have played with. I think there's a couple of black security guards, but they really could have played with that idea as well. Like it really is kind of a sea of white that he's facing here. Obviously, you've got um, Miss Perkins, who's but she's part of his team. So again, I think you know there were missed opportunities here, but they weren't they weren't aiming for that anymore. They wanted the safe comedy, didn't they? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. And you're right, throughout this, there are several to- moments when you sort of realize that there are certain jokes, you go, Yeah, I agree. You go, Oh, that would have been a good joke, <laughs> but mm. it's not. It's not there to be. It's there to be made, but it's not what, as you say, the the joke they want to make. Yeah. Um. He obviously goes in and straight away. Although you've got these massive guys in blazers, park security is rather poor. Oh, is, <laughs> yeah, awful. <laughs> Ward is seriously failing at his job as head of security. Yeah. Fire just walks immediately backstage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And just picks a um um a ride at random and Alien just goes Attack, in, isn't it? Alien yeah. Attack, which is uh it was Universal Studios uh, earthquake experience, mm-hmm. including um Battlestar Galactica Cylons. <laughs> yeah, it did look like that, yeah. Um no they are, they are. that was what they Actual are. Actual Cylons, yeah, yeah. Yeah, So I was like, cool. Um that's gonna that's do that. Mm-hmm. Um. So yes, you know, and then she sort of he meets. Um, I forget it. what's the name. The plays Miss Perkins. Uh, per- yes, Miss Perk. Yeah, but um, Teresa Randall is it? I think she's I in think Bad so. Boys, isn't she? As well, yes. she plays Martin Lawrence's wife in Bad Boys. Yeah. Um. Yeah. That that interaction is hilarious because he just walks down, walks into like the the control booth. She's in there at this point controlling Alien Attack. I definitely yeah. talked about. Her and what her job role is at Wonderworld because it appears to be yeah. everything. Because <laughs> she does ad, she does admin at one point. Yeah, she's doing other things. Yeah, random. They, they just switch people out. She's probably been 
uh, one of the mascot characters as well. You know, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like, well, how does do. how does this work? She's like, well, let me show you. What? No, who the fuck are you? Why are you back here? Where's yeah. your ID? <laughs> like, are you a predator? What's going? On? There's kids in here. No, it's it's an odd moment. It is, but again, this is part of the this is part of the format. Sure. Every hundred percent, yeah. Because this is where he does. This is where he flashes the badge, and all mm-hmm. of a sudden he's like, you know, I'm, um, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm security yeah. of this. I'm the house inspector. Yeah. I'm this. This is where he sort of like. This is the where the mouth comes in, isn't it? And he sort mm-hmm. of um gets you know gets through it that way. But he doesn't do that. He just sort of stands really there. Yeah. yeah. And she Flashes just sort of the says, Murphy smile. That was yeah. Enough. He's like, oh, you're you're a handsome, uh, you're a handsome black man. Of course, I shall uh, explain <laughs> to you and not question why you're backstage <laughs> at, the, at the rides. Um, I wonder if it was cut. I don't know. Like I read, I'm sure you did as well about Landis saying like he felt like Murphy was not trying. Essentially, he was sort of phoning yeah. in. He was not on board with the comedy. I wonder if some of these scenes did exist because it's like, you know, we, we have to hit these things. It's the Beverly Hills Cop movie. We'll yeah, talk yeah. about the, it's not a strip club anymore because they're watering it down, but there's the bar scene again later. Um, so I wonder if it was there, but Murphy was not giving it his all. So they were like, well, that's not working. We'll have to get rid of it. I'm not sure. No, that's a good point. That's a, that's a really good point. Like the setup is there. And I think, you know, for, for the improv, I mean, they routine. Yeah. You can see, like you know, there are routinely scenes where they are saying, you know, oh, here's the script, but don't worry about it too much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Go. And he probably sort of did some, like you say, lackluster attempts, and they've gone, yeah, this is, this isn't what we wanted. <laughs> let's mm-hmm. go back to, let's go back to the script. Okay, we'll we'll just do that. Um, yeah, because I mean, the chemistry is fine. It all sort of works, but lackluster, I think, is is that's the right word. Is yeah. yeah, I like that. It's less a blockbuster, more a lackluster. Mm. Yes, I like that. Yeah, <laughs> there's your there's your poster tagline. <laughs> um, but it does then. He does then have, as you say, the sort of the you said before the uh, the Ferris wheel moment. Yeah, security chasing, don't they? There, yeah, they they finally a shoot out in the like the hallways of this this again this kids adventure park, this kids wonder world. They have a shoot I, out I, there. Yeah, I love this is something that I've always been fascinated by in action films. The sort of police, security guards, anyone with a gun sees a bad putt guy and just starts randomly sort of spraying bullets <laughs> around anywhere because it's just sort of like, oh, that's my job. Um, but he, he, yeah, he cuts in line in front of <laughs> George Lucas, <laughs> yep. which is an, an odd. Um, I'd forgotten about this cameo, mm. and I was just like, "Oh shit, it's George Lucas!" Um, yeah, um, he gets on that, and you get the action scene. Yeah, which is pretty decent, to be fair. I mean, yeah, the green yeah. screen's awful, but it's ninety-four. We forgive that. It's like a Final Destination opening sequence. It's yes. kind of cool. I mean, it makes no sense that you're trying to get away from a bunch of security guards. So you get on a Ferris wheel. It's not a great game. A roller coaster, maybe, because it goes fast. The Ferris wheel just goes up in a big circle. Was, yeah, but they all come back. They all come back to the same point. Yeah. So they don't, <laughs> they don't go point, anywhere. Yeah. So it um, makes no sense logically, but it, it invites a, a good sequence, to be fair. Yeah. Um, it was really funny because I was, I was watching this, and then um, Alex just walked in, and she sort of saw, you know, that he climbs up on that wire, and you have the sort of the mm. cable, and he's got the two kids because he saves the he just saves these two children from a falling cable car. A Ferris wheel car, and even Alex, like, what? Where's he supposed to go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like he can't get down fast enough. Like, and then all of a sudden it cuts to him do- like dropping the last sort of seven or eight feet, and then rolling out the way. Yeah. Um. I mean, it works. It's a good. It's a good. Yeah. Action I mean, set piece. We we have to, you know, John McClane springing but from a fire hose from the yeah, top. Of the exactly. Tower. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whatever, it's fine. I mean, you know, when you start getting to nitty gritty logic, like how has he still got any skin left on his hands and all that yeah. stuff? But who cares? <clears throat> as a sequence, it actually works pretty well, I think. Yeah, I think, I think and it sets up again. We've seen Axel in the gunfight, but again, we've seen Axel using his wits and his sort of he's willing to do the stuff to save the kids and all that kind of stuff. So it's re establishing really- him as the good guy again. 
yeah, there's two moments I really like. The end when he sort of saved them and everyone's like, way as they would do, standing around chewing. And again, we get another really hard cut to him in the security yeah. office, which I think yeah. is quite funny. But before it as well, when he's got on there, first of all, he's got in his little cabin, as you said, he's pushed in line. And as he's going up, the security guys catch up with him. And they start like just grabbing a randomly pulling at the control, yeah. which is what makes it go haywire. Again, I'm not sure what, I suppose you work in security, you don't know how the carousels work, but well, yeah, but the person, work, but the but... person they barge out the way does. <laughs> yeah, it's like don't do that; it's going to cause a problem. Spark, spark, spark. Yeah, yeah I know. Or, they, or they could just stop and go. Can you stop this ride? There's a fugitive on there. We need it to come round slowly so we can get the red carousel. Like, yeah, there must be a reverse yeah, button, right? Yeah, there must be procedures for this kind of thing. <laughs> You'd hope so, but these guys do not follow it. But it's again, you know, the train yeah. by the walk. So what do you expect? He's clearly shit. It... Well, yeah, he's too busy trying to forge. Well, that's know, true. Money. Yeah. That's all he's interested in. Um, well, that's, that's a really interesting point. I guess John Saxon's character has employed him as a yeah. as a false head of security, hasn't he? Because actually, he really wants him there to be doing. So that is why he's bad at being a security lead. Because yeah, he's not really point. doing it. No. Um, but yeah, they, obviously, they, this is because this is where you sort of get first introduced to John Saxon as yeah. um, you know whatever the hell his role is. Like people's jobs in this are really nebulous. Like they have titles. He's park is he the park manager? Yeah, kind of. But like, Uncle, is it Uncle Dave? He Uncle runs... Dave is the owner. He's like Walt yeah. Disney. Uncle yeah. Dave is Walt Disney. And, and John um, Saxon is the park manager. I, I guess. Yeah, but hmm. he said a bit nebulous. Yeah, it's all a bit crazy. They're, I mean, if he's got you know, you're, you're, he's the park manager, and you've got head of security. Like, well, they're head of resourcing, and their department meetings must be really weird. <laughs> When if he's sort of reading through, like you know, and and Julie, you know, you did really well with resourcing this month. Thank you for keeping everyone. I was really worried we weren't going to have enough people. Cracking job, well done, head of catering. Uh, we need to up this, this, and this, uh, and security. Um, make sure nobody gets into that secret room yeah. <laughs> yeah. behind thingy, Mister Dewald. And everyone's like, "What the fuck are they talking about?" What I'm yeah. envisioning at that meeting as well, based on what happens later in the movie, is the head of the mascots will be there in the full uniform yeah. Yeah. with the head on, of course. Yes, of course. Because nobody yeah. ever takes the head off at this park either. Okie dokie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Doing the okie dokie shuffle. Um, yeah, it's a really, like, you know, odd setup. But, and of course, this is the thing we've sort of, we've had in all of these films is the villain is also a, a philanthropist and a pillar of the community and... Mm. They take it one step further in this because uh, we have the same scene again. Where all the tr- all the, the touch points are there um, later on. At this, this is the point where he, he, he identifies Dewalt mm-hmm. and he, he goes for him, um, and the cops come in. Billy and, and uh, Flint come in, and it's sort of it's all it's all so by the book, isn't it? Like you can just it go is, through. Yeah. Again. It's going to have this point where he then turns up and like Eddie um, uh, Axel turns up at an event and humiliates the mm-hmm. villain at this point that mm-hmm. you know it's a charity event and it goes on and on so it's obviously a really important and this is where i wonder where like what are they having to cut around because it's obviously a really important location as well because we will be back again in this room multiple times yes it's like but that that like off green i'm not sure what you call that color that kind of like sort of beige green that you get in these kind of f- films of these rooms we'll be back in this just like beige green room multiple times later in this movie but they've run out of money or like i say yeah i don't know that i i feel to me it felt like because that the they obviously universal granted them permission to use the earthquake ride mm-hmm. they then use it's paramount's theme park was, right and i didn't even know paramount had a theme park no and this is in northern california so um not as big as big as disney or, or universal so Wonderland is actually a uh, Wonderworld is actually a theme park owned by Paramount um, that they then allowed them to use. Mm. Um, but all the rooms, it cost them money. It still cost them part of the budget, although the film was made by <laughs> Paramount. But you know, um, the um, the all those other rooms, you know, the offices and that was was on a when I read it just said on a lot. Yeah, makes sense. So it wouldn't surprise me if they were just sort of like, this is the room, we've only got so much room, and we've yeah. got like Billy's office, and we've got this other thing, like we've got, so we've, we've got, got a security keep using... office, yeah, we've got the printing room, let's keep going back to these three places, yeah. Yeah, exactly, like we haven't got, we haven't got much space, let's just use these, 
and they've got some of the locations that can act as tunnels, and we'll just have people running around those a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There you go. So that'll work. Um, geography not being a strong suit with this film because some of these tunnels are, are massive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And clearly longer than the park is big. So <laughs> I don't know what purpose they serve. Um, but yeah, this is the this is where I think the point that you made before about the, the film sort of slowly sort of just sort of slides off, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Cause up until this point I've gone like yeah, this was quite good fun, you know, the, yeah. there's some bits and this and that, and then I'm like, okay, it's kind of now just falling into hitting those marks, and then never the, the, all it's highlighting to me from this point is yeah, it's all right, but it's not as funny as the last time they did this, or yeah, or as the action's not as as you said, geography cohesive or exciting, and there's no nothing showy that's not quite the right word but there's nothing like memorable or remarkable about the direction and yeah unfortunately it's it's all just a lesser version of what we've already seen twice yeah well, that's it i mean even think like you know even like murphy getting into the okie doki mm-hmm. mascot suit and all that and the only joke i like in that is the fact that they never take their heads off so they just keep referring to a sort of like you know hi dave how's the wife oh, how's the kids <laughs> and just sort of walk past each other so i thought there's the odd good joke. Um, but yeah, it kind of just sort of starts to blend together where I'm just sort mm. of like, oh yeah, this is happening. And then it'll, you know, then I know what's going to happen next. And yeah, I think that's a problem. I just, yeah, the last half an hour, uh, I only watched it last night and I, I don't know if I can really remember. It. And and I think the, the repetition of the locations is a problem as well yeah. because it all just starts to, blend into one which scene was it when that happened and then which scene is it when that happens and oh yeah john saxon gets killed at one point but was it the second scene or the third scene or that it all just starts to like blend together well this is the other point you say about like you get characters and key quite key characters die and the, but their deaths are so like unmemorable mm-hmm. there's no one given like um you know no one really gets they're just not as memorable, are they? I mean, when you've had like Bridget Nielsen walking around like, um, like some sort of eighties Adonis, sort of like you know, yeah, yeah. tapping people and stuff, you're a bit like, oh, that I remember shit from that film. And Tony Scott's sort of direction, especially if you, you know, you said about on the on the, uh, the last episode the um, the shots of like the red dirt and the sun mm-hmm. coming down, and there's that hue across it all, and it's really cool, and it looks it looks really impressive. In contrast, this film's kind of flat. Very flat, yeah, agreed. There's just... And whether that's the sterile environment they've got the movie set in, whether that's the change of focus, as you said, to the four quadrants away from... I, I'm, maybe it's all combined, I'm not sure. Maybe, you know, if you're setting a film in a kid's theme park, you are there. But then by the same token, you do have explosions and machine gun fire and people falling from high cable cars and... Just none of it, yeah. None of it is is exciting or memorable. Or uh, and I, you know, I think it's got to come back to one thing for me. It just keeps coming back to the same thing, like the direction. I think Flat's a great uh, description of it. He just wasn't the right person to bring this to life because he doesn't know how to do these scenes successfully. I love the Blues Brothers. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's nostalgic. We've watched it a lot as kids. I think we probably both did, and it's funny. And but actually, when you watch it as an adult the direction of the film is the least remarkable thing. It's that, yes. it's, that, it's that the performances are so good. It's that the scenarios are so good, that the cameos are so good, that the songs are so good. The direction is a bit of a nothing, really. Well, I think this is the thing. I think Landis really is one of those directors that I'm just double-checking. Um, when you look at his, um, his back catalogue, mm-hmm. I mean, he has made. I mean, like he made American Wealth in London, which is one of my all-time favorite films. Yeah, but again, it's not the direction of that film. Like he contributes to it, and he brings a nice sort of dark humor to it. But like, it's not. No one goes, "Well, it deserved an Oscar for that for direction." It's, oh no, Rick Baker's mm. um, werewolf transformation is insane, and 
you know, there's some really good gore and, and the, the makeup effects are incredible and the nightmare sequences and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But then you look at, I'm just looking, he did sort of, um, he did Thriller, but it's a mm-hmm. Michael Jackson video. So it's about Jacko dancing. Trading Places, again, Murphy and Aykroyd. Um, and it's kind of like, you know, Spies Like Us was a, was a flop. Three Amigos, again, you're looking at like SNL kind of guys, Steve Martin, Chevy Chase, Martin Short. Then he gets coming to America. It's all, he did, he, he directed Oscar, the Oof. Stallone film, which I'd forgotten about. And I think everyone should forget about. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it kind of feels the more you look at Landis's career, the more you sort of realize he's not the greatest director he's just been lucky to work with some incredibly talented comedians that when they bring their a game really shine on screen and people mm-hmm. go oh fucking hell, the three amigos was a good film not thinking you know god landis did some good work on that you go well it was steve martin jerry chase and martin short in their prime so mm. yeah i don't know it feels you can't really miss with that one well, exactly, and I think maybe that's what he was expecting with this. He's like, oh, yeah, mm. this is Eddie Murphy coming back to Axel Foley. Like, it's going to be gold. You know, mm. this is um, – can't miss with this. But but if – it's like, yeah, Foley hasn't been given – or Murphy hasn't been given the energy injection to make it work. No. And actually, he would be much more suited to the latest stuff. I mean, if he was doing – Nutty Professor or the Clumps or all of those kind of yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. would fit those worlds much better than he would this. He just hasn't have the edge this film requires. And then that sort of saps it away from, from Murphy, I think, and from Foley as well. Yeah. What's really interesting, I mean, just to say with the ending, the the, the, the shootouts and stuff, at the end, this is the thing almost about it being flat. Mm. All the shootouts in the ending, um, as I was watching it, it's in a theme park. Mm-hmm. And you have he obviously met Serge again, and he's had he's got that big stupid gun, and I think that's a good one note joke highlight of the movie is Serge yeah, Kendrick. yes, yeah, and he, he's describing. I love the fact he's like Jackie Sloan came and bought fourteen, <laughs> Sly came in and bought <laughs> yeah. ten. This is really he's brilliant, like that whole little sketch. But again, yeah, if you watch it, when you watch it, you realize that. Um, Serge is brilliant. Like he's got Bronson all that energy. Yeah. yeah. He, and he's improvising. You can tell. Yeah. Judge Reinhardt is trying to stifle a laugh. <laughs> much as we said before in um other scenes when it was Murphy doing it to to um Ashton and to Reinhardt before. Now it's yeah. Pincho is getting Reinhardt to crack to corpse. Yeah. I love improv- it when he's talking to him. He's talking to him about like, you know, about the fact he made him an espresso or whatever before. He says, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> He starts from a teat telling me about like something else, and it's 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 good. Like he's you can see he's mm. trying to make them laugh, but the other side of it, Murphy is couldn't it's care just less. couldn't care. Less. Yeah, like there's no sort of like he's smiling, you know, going yeah yeah, but I need the gun. But even when he leaves, he's like, oh, we're gonna go. Like there's an yeah. announcement. He's like, oh, we're gonna go because that's when they're sort of seeing Dewalt and stuff. But it feels almost like. Even like it's not just Axel Foley saying we're gonna go. It's like Murphy going like, okay, well this seems over. I've got to go. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Like Pincho and um, Murphy together in the first movie is electric. Yeah, you can tell that they're both really trying to get each other to go. That, that yeah. probably was the goal of the two of them. Was like, who's going to make each other laugh first? You're right. Murphy feels completely disconnected here. And again, I'm sure you had the same thing in Pincho saying that he was essentially depressed through the whole of this shoot. And yeah. yeah. This scene really shows that he's just not engaged at all. It makes me wonder, like almost, it's, it's one of those things that I don't, I don't know where Murphy's head is at, but it, it feels a bit like, and I've, you've been there that, you know, well, I'm saying I've been there. I should say is, you go to an event or you do something where you are like, I, I know I can't compete at my best, so mm. I'm almost not gonna bother. Mm-hmm. It feels a little bit like that, doesn't it? Like I can't beat Pincho at this point, and yeah. so I'm not. I'm just. I'm just not going to bother. I'm yeah. just going to let it slide. And it, yeah, so this, yeah, so it feels disappointing in that respect. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, but the, yeah, but again, with the shootout, you've got a theme park, <laughs> and they don't utilize it in any real way. 
there's, there's a bit of popcorn going all over the place, and there's some, mm-hmm. the, the, you know, um, years later in in um, Zombieland, you know, we will mm-hmm, get mm-hmm. an amazing use <laughs> of a theme yeah. park for a shootout and stuff like that. Um, it, even it just... like Jurassic World, you know what I mean, even that sort of plays yeah. a bit better. This feels like um, like a Roger Moore esque James Bond. If it's like the Man with the Golden Gun, or it's like it's it's scene setting because it looks cool, but then you just sort of have a couple of blokes walking around it. Yeah, <clears throat> and the fact that you've been you've been sort of granted this set, and I'm pretty sure you know, I'm sure Paramount like. Don't blow up or damage too yeah. much stuff, but <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, you're not really doing a great deal, um, and because it, it then goes into the the ride, this, it's like the land of the dinosaurs or something, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, whatever it is, this thing is, and it may, you you know, you saw it, the, the year before this was Child's Play three, mm-hmm. notorious Child's Play three, ends with a similar kind of scenario, uh, and Chucky sort of getting pushed into um, a fan and his face all gets cut up and he gets the sort of the more iconic um, stapled up look in the, in the next film. So we've had this thing of th- of sequences happening in theme parks, but this just, again, feels like there's no imagination with it. It's sort of like, oh, someone's going to come out and be kind of scared by mm. um, a, a saber tooth tiger, a saber tooth tiger or yeah. Yeah, a frozen caveman, and they're going to mm. shoot at it. But like, yeah, this there just feels like a lack of imagination mm. for for this end piece. Yeah, um, and no threat. Like everybody, yeah, everybody gets shot at, in this end point, all killed. Yeah, and also shot and should be killed, but are not. I'm sure we'll talk about that. But but nobody ever really feels it. Never really feels dangerous, despite the fact that everybody gets shot. I never really feel you, you mentioned before, like, you know, John Saxon gets killed and there's no like, yeah. whoa, this big bad guy's gone. It's just like, move on, move on. And it feels this way again here at the end sequence. Like, yeah, Billy gets absolutely annihilated. Yeah. Foley gets shot. Flint gets shot. Obviously, bad guys get shot and killed. Like, everybody is, is shot at a certain point. But, and it's the pacing of the shooting, though. And this was again, so again, watch. I really watched it this time because, in fact, I watched back the final part of this film. I watched back, I watched it twice. Mm. And you're right, because the two things we say about like how uh, forgettable it is I couldn't even tell you how DeWalt dies. No, you're right. And I watched it like less than 48 hours ago. <laughs> yeah, it's so sort of like, yeah. But the problem I have. They clearly want to get to. They, they have an end scene in their head. They had a scene. They had a shot in their head where it was going to be um, Flint, Murphy, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Flint, Foley, and then um, Billy being all shot up. And that was the point. They were yeah. all going to be shot up. Oh, you're all battered at the end of this one. Da da da. That was good. That's the end shot. That's what they wanted. Cool. How do we get there? Well, we'll just shoot them. <laughs> yeah. That is it. That, yeah. that, that's it. There's no like, oh, well, Foley, um, he'll get shot defending, um, you know, uh, Vanessa or or um, yeah. or Miss saving Miss Perkins or saving a kid or mm. doing something heroic or like he's not. He's just going to get shot. I, I don't, and it wasn't even that. Then was it? They were having a bit of a grapple. Yeah. Well, at one point, you get shot in the leg. Yeah. And then he gets shot in the arm, I think, and he has a little bit of blood in his face. And then Flint gets shot by accident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then I, and Billy's is even worse, I think. Yeah, Billy. Well, Billy's is like, yeah, is the laziest. Yeah, it's like a gunslinger moment, which is kind of cool. Yeah, but it should be like, there's like you said, there's no stakes, there's no purpose for them being shot. And I go back to comparable action films. Um you know, like Lethal Weapon yeah. is, is probably a similar one. And yeah. you always have, like, you know, rigs on the lawn in the yeah. first one fighting. Diplomatic immunity. Yeah, or you yeah, you get Absolutely. those moments, yeah. like, you know. Um, or three, you'll get, like, the, the armor-piercing bullets, and you'll get, like, mm. a purpose. Like, someone's going to get hurt, but there's, there's, like, a purpose to it. Um, even the lesser four... You know, with with uh, Jet Li, they're like Under you know, water, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, yeah they're t- you know, I'm, cool. I, can, I can feel you, brother. I can feel you. And they're sort of like, mm. you feel that says, there's none of that here. They're just sort of like they get shot, 
I mean, Billy has been mown down with a machine gun. Yeah. yeah. He manages to stumble into this Land of the Dinosaurs type room where Flint and Foley have got a couple of scrapes. I mean, he is literally like hemorrhaging blood. Yeah. It's like, ha ha, it, Billy's been shot. Well, no, Flint's line is, as he laughs, he points and says, he's going to need medical attention. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, no shit. Yeah. <laughs> quick yeah he's lost half his body weight in blood <laughs> yeah um so yeah this this ending is so rushed mm. and ill thought out um that it is it's kind of sort of it just sort of ends flint just turns up as well by the way mm. like he turns up here's is a problem at, at, at wonderland at wonder world and um it's almost he, the same scene again, isn't it? When he's like, oh, Foley. Yeah. And he just sort of turns <laughs> up. And he's sort of yeah. like, oh, well, he's not. And that's he's when not... he mows down the guy in the cable car. He doesn't even know that's a bad guy, by the way. No. It's just a guy up there in a cable car. And he's like, oh, there's a machine gun here on the floor. And just yeah. he mows him down. Yeah. I mean, we should, well, the one point we haven't mentioned, sort of like, they try to add tension to this film as well. By putting Foley on the run, they make for for a mm-hmm. portion of the film they make him a fugitive because Uncle Dave, mm-hmm. they shoot Uncle Dave and then they rush him to hospital. But it's Foley that puts him into the hospital, and then there's this kind of sequence of, um, you know, people almost identifying or almost ident or capturing. I mean, that's right. Foley. He's at the like the bar, isn't he? And all the there's all the old white guys. Did you hear someone that shot Uncle Dave? Yeah, like, yeah, really? yeah. And then he all looked round and he's gone. One's Ray Harryhausen, <laughs> isn't it? I read. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that whole, as you said, like sort of minor subplot doesn't make any sense really either. There was a, what was it, a, the former employee, one another employee, some other random, not sure what his job is guy, disappeared three weeks ago. Oh, there was the... Um... It was the former head of he was he was the former head of security. Right. Okay. So actually, DeWall's only been in the job for three weeks, is he? Okay. And, yeah. And well, a, that, yeah. I don't know. There's this MacGuffin letter that I, I can't remember what happened to that either. Like again, it's all just so forgettable, unfortunately. Because it means nothing. Mm. Because again, one of the things that's missing from this is an investigation. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, even with like you know in the last one we had um, you know Axel using his street smarts to. Mm to do things he would look he found i mean it was ridiculous he found a, a perfectly placed matchbook but <laughs> he then uses super glue to find a, a you know a, a fingerprint and then mm-hmm. he's able to use a chewing gum wrapper to to break a um yeah like the, security. the, the wire alarm yeah, it? yeah all yeah. that stuff shows his street smarts versus the you know the bureaucratic sort of beverly hills cops that's kind of that's the point yeah in this, just running the, around like a headless chicken, basically. In the, yeah, exactly. Like he sees the wall. You did it, mm. and then he later sees that there's if he, he accidentally sort of comes across the printing machine with the um, mm. and then there's only one point where he gets the letter and he holds it with next to like a twenty, and he's like, mm. "It's the same money. The money they were taking from Detroit was." Um, oh, that's high, right. He- yeah, it's a bit of it, doesn't he? Looks under like a microscope or the yeah, with the, the, yeah. the car light with Uncle Dave. Hmm. But that's it, and they go hmm. like, "Oh, we've confirmed it." And he's like, "Yeah, but you kind of knew that already." Hmm. Like, you know, what did you think they were doing? Um. So yeah, I don't know. It it all feels a little bit again. Like this is the flatness of it. Like there's nothing hmm. memorable. Um. There's one thing that <laughs> even to join the end sequence. There's people running around. There's people shooting, and I hate things like this in the film. It's a, it's a joke, but it's kind of a joke I can't let go. Mm. So what we've seen is they have this sort of like digital setup where what will be printed on the on the money is um, on this screen. Mm-hmm. Also, lots of other films have told me that money's printed with with plates, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> not off a printer. So that was shit. <laughs> um, but the, for the for the sort of you got the wonder wonder wall dollars wonderland dollars um, and then what you have is at one point Dewalt comes in and finds that there's a, a Foley dollar and it's a picture of Axel Foley it just says kiss my ass <laughs> and I, all I can think is who took that photo <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, Miss Perkins, of course, because she does everything. But yeah, like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> it's such a weird thing. Was going, oh, he st- he he stayed, created yeah. a, a template yeah. <laughs> for money. No, all of a sudden he knows the technology. Yeah, took a photo of himself, logging like, in on Photoshop, moving yeah. the head, like do, doing the dotted liner. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hadn't even thought of it, but you're absolutely right. <clears throat> it's so. It's one of the things that like, and it's, it's. I know it's supposed to be a passing joke. But it feels like it's the same as the dance at the beginning, mm-hmm. where it's it, all of a sudden it just lurches out at me and says, "This isn't reality." Mm-hmm. And you go, mm-hmm. "Oh yeah, okay, we're not we're not in the same film I was ten minutes ago." Um. So yeah. Um. But yeah, no, we we obviously get to the end, and despite everything, everyone's fine. Uncle yeah. Dave has returned. Um. And I yeah. We have a ceremony at the end, mm. and in you know, to honour um, uh, whatever that's happened, and this great person, Axel Foley, they ha- they introduce Axel Fox, mm. and uh, again, I don't, what what you before I say, what were your thoughts on this this uh, ending ceremony piece? Awful. <laughs> <laughs> Should I be blunt? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it feels tacked on. It doesn't feel like it's from the same movie. No, uh, nobody feels like they really want to be there. You have the awkward moment of Teresa Randall, like they have like a kind of innuendo joke between them again. It feels kind of James Bondy. It just that feels... joke is awful. Have you ever have you been on the Tunnel of Love? Yeah, I didn't know they had one here. And she's like, we don't. And you're just like, hey, what? This is yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, are you making a pussy joke? In yeah. a... <laughs> I thought Christmas only comes once a year. Do you know what I mean, it works. Yeah, in one, but here, yeah. So, um, and and, and like. Who in this thousands of people that are at uh, Wonderworld yeah. know the story, give a fuck out the, about the story, knows who, uh, they care that Uncle Dave's alive, I get it, but know who Axel is. Why has he suddenly got, like, again, that, that just makes no practical, logical sense at all. To me, they felt like the, the, a better scene, and I know I did, I'm, I'm going to do it in my podcast. <laughs> uh, I heard you f- talk about it with Tony. Jack always yeah. calls me out for this. Yeah, um, the because it feels too big. You're right; it feels too big. Yeah, this huge it's like the reworked Return of the Jedi, isn't it? You know when they reworked Return yes, of the Jedi, exactly. And every yeah. planet, they're like, Hooray! yeah, exactly. Like, they know why. Why is the whole of like yeah, South California all of a sudden celebrating that that you know Dave's able to come back to to work? <laughs> yeah, like, it's it's bizarre. It, bring it down. Make it smaller. Mm-hmm. Have Uncle Dave thanking um, thingy, but like you know, have it had that they've had conversations. And he says, "Look, uh, you know, you, you know, whilst we were recuperating, you told me all about why, you know, why you were coming. We, we fully, I fully explained, um, and to honor your sacrifice, and everything else. Like we're going to bring two characters mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, to the park. We're going to introduce Axel Fox, and we're going to introduce." Todd the turtle or turtle sure. Todd. Yeah, yeah. Like actually acknowledge that <laughs> Lieutenant Dark Todd was killed as well, and this whole thing was about his death. Like, mm. and his death was, you know, is being honored as well. Like it had the fact he's completely forgotten at the end. Yeah. And kind makes of that relevant again, makes that inciting incident relevant again, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. Just something like I say, make it smaller because it just feels so silly. This ending again, mm. well, it's, it feels like a landis ending. This feels, it does. um, you know, like they wanted something else, yeah. And Murphy's, I suppose you're right, he has been shot in the leg. Foley's been shot. In the leg. I was thinking, like, why is he in a wheelchair? Is it just because Murphy couldn't be fucked? But uh, you're <laughs> right, he has been shot in the leg, but also, I think probably because Murphy couldn't be fucked. I bet, I bet there is that thing where they were like, could you stand on stage? He's like, no, yeah, no. yeah, yeah. No, we'll if you if you chair. could if you could wheel me off because I can't even be bothered to leave the scene, um, yeah. I would greatly appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, um, it's just, it's it's such a weirdly down ending, um, and you know I'm just looking again at his sort of this period like he hadn't done a great deal, but this is this is his transition. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, two things happen next. Um, that I think set um, Murphy on his trajectory. Yeah. Bad Boys comes out the following year. 
Yeah, I mean, when you compare the two, geez. Yeah, and, and no Will Smith and Martin Lawrence basically shit all over this. Yeah, they're, like, they're inspiration, as we you know we've said. Yeah, like, clearly inspired by Murphy and Foley. Yeah, but, I mean, the, comparing the two is does Not this even worse a disservice. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then he he went on and he made um in the, that that year his film for ninety five is Vampire in Brooklyn. Mm. Which Never seen it, that. It's it's an odd, it's an oddity. Mm. It's a, it's an it's an oddity. It's a Wes Craven film mm-hmm. that includes. We've seen him do it little bits and pieces, right? And I don't know about sort of like Boomerang or the Distinguished Gentleman, but this is him doing multiple characters under heavy makeup. Okay, because he's like the writer. It's like a, it's kind of his baby, isn't it? He's... It is. He's got Craven as the director. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's not a terrible film. I mean, it, it gets more hate than I think it deserves, but it's mm-hmm. not a good film mm-hmm. by any stretch. Um, and But is that the first multiple Murphy movie? We've seen him do it a little bit in uh, Coming to America. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. That in The Barbers. Awesome. Yeah. Um, but that's kind of small. But Vampire in Brooklyn are some very distinctive characters within mm-hmm. the film and that leads on to the the nutty professor mm-hmm. and i think that's that sort of sets the course there. that makes yeah. quite a bit of money yeah. and everyone loves him playing all these roles and yeah you're yeah. right yeah and that's the that's the kitty thing then he goes off to you know, there's metro which is kind of awful but um you're going to get mulan doctor doolittle bowfinger nutty professor 2 and then eventually shrek and mm-hmm. The rest is kind of history. Um, when's this is kind of it's on topic but off topic. When's Austin Powers? Is that later? Is that nine? That's like ninety seven. I think so. Yeah, late it's 90s. clearly an era of these kind of post SNL playing multiple character. It's a big deal around here, isn't it? And I, I think it got. It, yeah, I mean, it gets teased in the early nineties because you say mm. about um, Austin Powers, but again, Mike Myers had done it several times. You know, if you've ever seen um, So I Married an Axe Murderer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Which I kind of adore that film. Yeah, brilliant. Um, you know, and he he done it a couple of times. I think you know. So yeah, I, you're right. I think there's that thing of, and the '90s is a kind of the the second wave of SNL and and, and mm. Second City sort of uh, comedy films being made. Um, so yeah, it's a it's an interesting one. But I I do wonder what would have happened if they'd have put much more energy into this like if this mm. had been s- closer to beverly hills cop 2 yeah well if this had been michael bay you know yeah oh say what, say what we about where he's gone but where he started you know the rock and bad Boy yeah 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 and... yeah if this is if he'd have had his if he'd have had his break a year early mm. and you'd have started with murphy and bay mm. oh my god that yeah the the world would be a very different place mm. Probably not a better place, but it would still be a decent <laughs> place. <laughs> yes. Anyway, there we go. So that's yeah. So Beverly Hills Cop three. Mm. We end the we end that sort of franchise. I think they thought it was done. Um, I said, well, I mean, what, it was thirty like, years? Yeah, yeah, yes. thirty I mean, years. It took franchise them. Franchise killer. That. Well, you say thirty years. Mm-hmm. They constantly tried to bring it back. Um, Murphy was often questioned and and sent proposals for sequels and ideas and well into the early 2000s um then they did um a pilot for a tv show Mm. uh where he was going to be the father and there was going to be a young actor taking over as the new Mm -hmm. uh, kind of axel foley figure that was in i think that was 2009 2010 and the pilot didn't go anywhere um, and so, yeah, it's always been like, you know, bubbling, bubbling behind the character. It's one mm-hmm. of those characters that I think it's it's his character. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, finally, I think you know he he seems to have had he has a good relationship with Netflix. Mm. You know, he's mm. he's done things like you know, um, Dolomite is my name, and yeah, a um, couple of other things that he's done with them have, have done well. And he's, I think, he feels, you know, I think they felt like it was a a good way to go. They are, they allow quite a lot of creative freedom, don't they? Netflix. 
So yeah, uh, yeah, I imagine he he likes that. And so yeah, in 2024 we had or we have Beverly Hills Cop Axel F. Mm. Um, which again, I don't look. You've had one, two, and three. Just stick a four on it. It just. <laughs> <laughs> this thing really annoys me but yeah so yes that is what we will talk about when we next get together we will come back and everyone is older and wiser and and slightly more grizzled and but uh it's got me the cast you know just ryan holds back obviously mm-hmm. murphy's back joseph gordon levitt who i always like mm-hmm. i think he's good so um you know kevin bacon mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so yeah it's it's, you know, it's a pretty it's a pretty well established cast, so it's you know it's uh, it'll be interesting to see what we think. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I will be coming that fresh, as you know. I still, I'm holding out. I'm holding out. Are you holding out? Yeah, I know you. Oh, have, okay, I I've seen it. I'm, I'm not going to spoil yeah. anything, but it's. I mean, you know, it's a, it's, it's a solid cast, and um, this is the age of, um, you know, legacy sequels and mm-hmm. all that. Will it lead to a fifth film? Um, probably not for some of the cast. I think you know. I think Judge Reinhold made it quite clear. He was a bit like, yeah, this is this was fun, but mm-hmm. like, you know, I'm kind of done with doing these kinds of films. So um, we shall see. We shall see next time we get together. Yeah, great. Looking forward Brilliant. to it. Brilliant. Well, Jack, anything you want to promote and how, you know, you've got the, the state is, is almost, is almost done. And yeah. So depending on when this comes out, I've officially recorded the last single film focused back to filmography, looking at the state. So I did the beekeeper with wow. Dan and Glenn a few days ago. So that is done. I've got my wrap up episode to do where we're going to see if we can decide what the top five classic Statham movies of all time Ooh. are. I'll Ooh. be asking you to contribute to that as somebody who has. War been, is uh, definitely in there. I mean, war's <laughs> <laughs> as a free, as a frequent guest on the show, I'll be asking for your thoughts on that, but I'm going to have somebody on to talk that through with me and hopefully have everyone's thoughts that have guested on the show as well. And then, yeah, it'll be time to launch season two, which I know every time I've been talking with you, I keep saying I haven't quite, revealed yet i haven't quite revealed yet i still haven't quite revealed yet i don't know why i'm holding on to it but i think in the last episode of season one of the yeah you hold on to that that's a yeah. that's a that's a, a big reveal for your show but yeah, yeah. It's, it's so that's time. that show yeah brilliant okay well for us it's been a bit we had a bit of a summer holiday we've uh um had a break but you know we're all taking a break it's warm it's uh mm. so you know don't chill chill out a bit but on the next episode uh we get another film from the early 90s another flop mm-hmm. <laughs> considered by many um uh, but i'm joined by tony farina and julian darius to discuss the bruce willis pet project uh hudson hawk mm. and um yeah we'll be giving some thoughts on that i'm, I'm, I'm fascinated because that's a really but basically i think it's gonna be interesting because it's basically three people coming together that kind of love the film right um yeah but uh, i'll be interested what, you know other people's thoughts on that yeah before we that's... go into it that was in hard rotation in my youth. Yeah. It's As were most film. Bruce Willis films, to be fair. But um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, just didn't escape it. No, no. P- peak Bruce Willis at this point, early 90s. Mm. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for sticking with us. And Jack, thank you very much for coming back for Beverly Hills Cop 3 and sitting through it. I really appreciate yeah. you, you <laughs> taking the time. Um, but for now, thank you very much. Enjoy your holiday. And uh, you, we shall see you on the next episode. Mm.